Good morning, Cornerstone family. Thank you for joining us online today. Come on, let's worship with all of our heart, our mind, and soul. Let's worship our God together. Come on. Filled with His glory 
us this week, and I pray, God, just clear our mind, clear our hearts of anything going on, and I pray you may heal our hearts, God, and heal our families, and heal everything that's going on in life, and our job, and our relationship, God, we give it all to you, everything we have, we give it all to you, we bless you, so get our hearts ready right now, God, as we receive your word, we receive your message, God, bless our pastor as he speaks, God, and I pray just... Be with everyone at home, God. Help them to receive your word. Give us ears to hear and an open heart to hear what you have to say to us, God. So fill our homes with your Holy Spirit. Father, we long to hear from you. We give all the glory and honor and praise. You bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, all the family say. Good morning, Cornerstone family. It is great to worship with you today. I'm excited as we jump into Romans today. Uh, this is kind of a, a turn now, a leg that is new. The first 11 chapters, Paul has been addressing um, theology, our relationship with God, our vertical relationship with him, how God's grace and mercy uh, forgives our sins and we can have a relationship with him. Well, today, now we're going to start looking at the vertical and the horizontal, our vertical relationship with God to worship him and put him first in our life, and also the responsibility of fellowship. And that's been our theme this year is faith and fellowship. We need one another to encourage one another and to lift each other up and to serve God in our lives, to help more people find and follow Jesus. So our big idea in this uh, series is if we want real life change, we must allow God's word to transform us. So here we are, Romans chapter 12. He's going to talk about worship. And as he talks about worship, I, I wanted to go all the way back to chapter 1 and remind us of what Paul had told us about worship. We're built for worship. I know, I, I know there's some myths about worship. Some people think worship is just a genre of music. And that's what it is. It's more than music. Uh, some people think that worship is really mostly for women and children. Uh, and, and you see that uh, in churches today, it's often more populated by women and children. Uh, where are the real men? Well, where do real men go on the Sunday? 
Sometimes fishing, yes. <laughs> that was a shot. Okay, I got it. Uh, sometimes they go golfing, uh, watch a football game, right? I, we, we, uh, so we worship something, whether it's God or whether it's the created. Look at verses, uh, this is Romans one twenty five. It says this. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. It's all about giving glory to God. But the thing is, is we're designed for worship. And so if I don't worship God, I will worship something else. Now, it could be football. It, it could be golf. It could be fishing. I know that's too close to home. I mean, it could be... Um, my work, your work, I, you know, we can you know, pour all of our energy and time. Whatever we make as the most priority of our life, that becomes our focus of worship. And, and what Paul is saying here in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 25, he says we're either going to worship the creator or the created. Uh, so we can worship things around us instead of the creator. And that's what happens when we reject our creator. So today, when we get into Romans chapter 12, uh, he is going to talk about the necessity, the urgency of true worship, how important that we focus in on our relationship with God. Uh, so I'm going to give you three questions to help you live a life of true worship. Uh, the first question is this. Who or what do you make the biggest sacrifice for? What, what is, when you get up in the morning, what, what is the first thing on your mind? When your feet hit the floor, what's the number one thing on your mind that's important for that day? When you go to bed at night, when, you, when your head hits the pillow, what's on your mind? What's the most important thing for you? And they'll often tell us what is most important for us, right? And, and so the question here, watch Watch what he says, Romans 12, verse 1. Who or what do you make the most sacrifice for? He says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He's urging us. He's begging. He's pleading. He just talked about God's mercy through chapter 9 and 10 and 11, how God has shown mercy to the Jewish people, how God has shown mercy to those of us who did not know God originally. You know, we didn't grow up in faith, and yet God had mercy on us. God has had mercy on all of us because all of us have sinned. In view of his mercy, worship him. Give your bodies, give your life to him. Uh, this is a priority for a Christian, uh, but often we see that God becomes second priority. He becomes third priority. He becomes an afterthought. And, and so the urging here, Paul is leaning into this saying, if you know God's mercy, if you've experienced God's mercy, if, if you realize that without Christ, we would all be condemned. But through Christ, we have been shown forgiveness, his mercy. We, we have access to God 24-7. We have his grace in our lives. In view of all this, we need to worship him. This is the, uh, the same um, plea that Joshua gave to the children of Israel as they had spent 40 years in the desert just before their about to go back into the promised land. One more try. You know, this is the 40-year delay here. Joshua notices that they're, they're debating. And he's kind of like done with it. You know, it's like, you got to make a decision. But for me and my house, this is what we're going to do. Let's read what he says. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. So whether the Egyptian gods or these other gods, Baal, Ashura, uh, these gods of harvest, that really aren't gods. 
You decide what you're going to worship. But Joshua's statement is the same urgency we see in Romans 12. But as for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. He's urging them to make a choice. But he knows, I don't have the authority in your life to do that. I can't control you. You personally have to make that choice for you. For me, for my household, I can choose what we're going to do. But you must make this decision. And as Paul is in Romans 12, 1, he's saying, you need to make a decision. I'm urging you, uh, in the view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Be all in for your Savior. Worship him. I, I think about the mercy God has, has showered upon us, the mercy of, that is not only our salvation, but we read in, in Scripture that his mercy is renewed every day. I don't know about you, but did you blow it yesterday? In the last couple of days, I mean, did you lose your temper? Was there something that you knew you were supposed to do and you just went, oh, I didn't do that? God's been so merciful. How could we not give him ourselves? So who or what do you sacrifice for? I know we all make sacrifices for different things in our life, and we'll sacrifice for our kids, we'll sacrifice for our jobs, we'll sacrifice for our sports, our activities, our hobbies. But what's the most important thing in your life that you're willing to give your all to? That's the big question here. What will you give your life for? So the first question to really hone in on what will I worship? Will I have true worship in my life? It's who or what do I make the biggest sacrifices for? Then the second question is, is what areas are you conforming to the culture? Look what he says here in verse 2. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world, our culture seems to be going farther and farther away from the principles of God's word, farther and farther away from grace and mercy and forgiveness. So where are you allowing yourself to be conformed, uh, to start to mold into the image of this world? Now, when Paul was writing this in the first century, he's writing it to uh, Jews and Gentiles, Christians in the church, and one of the things that was tempting to get acceptance in the social world, to get acceptance in the business world, was to blend in, to mold in to the Roman culture. A part of that was once a year you proclaim Caesar is your Lord. You'd only have to do it once. And it didn't matter if you meant it or not, as long as you publicly said it and gave your little tithe, you would be accepted in the business world. But if you refused, you lost your right to be in the business world. And, and that could be your family's income. And so there's a sacrifice to be paid. Uh, Galatians, Paul goes into detail about following the pattern of this world, about our bodies and, and how we need to make a choice in our life. We can either serve what our pleasures want to do or we can serve the world, our culture, or we can serve the Lord. And, and this is how Paul describes it in Galatians 5. He says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. I don't know, do we have that today? Do we? Yes. Uh, today's uh, sexuality I mean, being taught in our schools. The confusion that brings to our children. It, we have a choice. Are we just going to fall along and accept and be part of that? Or are we going to stand up for our faith? And we don't have to be rude, but we do need to stand up for our faith in love, but also affirming that God loves us and he designed us to, to have limits on our sexuality. Because if we don't, we actually hurt one another. It destroys marriages. And the proof is all around us. And yet, 
our culture wants to make no limits on sexuality, and now it's being taught in our schools. So to worship the Lord, to really worship him in truth, we need to make a choice. Are we going to conform to our culture, or will we choose to stand up for truth in God's word? Then he says, idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft. And there's, today, I, there's a lot of it going on today. Um, I know Halloween can be a big promotion of that. I think some do that. I think a lot harmlessly have no idea. <laughs> I think some just have fun. Uh, we do an alternative. We do, you know, kind of a harvest fast and um, throw candy at kids. You know, we, we have a fun time. But I, you know, again, we need to stand up for our faith, but we don't need to be rude about it. And I think that's really important. I, my my uh, neighborhood, they know where we stand, um, but we're not rude about it. We give candy to kids, right? You know, it's like everybody else is doing that. We're going to be nice. We're going to be kind. And, and I, I think that's wise. But we need to stand up for truth. And so when we can, we need to share the truth about there is only one God. Not all religions are the same. Far from it. The good news, the grace and mercy that is found in Jesus Christ is not found in any other religion. Every other religion is trying to earn your way to heaven. Every other religion is, God is kind of like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. That is not the God of heaven. That's not the God of creation. He loves us. And because we have no way of saving ourselves, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him would not perish. We must put our faith in Christ. And then, he, then he mentions this. He says, um, hostility, uh, quarreling. I mean, do we conform to that today? Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, uh, dissensions, divisions, envy. And, and I, I think about, again, what's being taught in our culture, what's now being brought into our schools uh, with cancel culture, critical race theory, uh, the teaching of division is now, it's like widely accepted. But it's all divisive. And, and, and we need to stand up for truth. Again, we don't have to be rude. But we do need to make a stand for truth. And, and putting blame on someone who has loved people, <laughs> accusing others, not for their actions, but maybe for their forefathers. <laughs> That's not what is true in God's word. We're accountable for our actions, responsible for our actions. And all we see is division and hate, and it gets worse. So we can be the sanity in our community that brings about love, that brings about peace, that brings about forgiveness. And yes, we teach absolutely you need to respect all people, from all nationalities, from all economics. We've got to be careful how we start to mold in to our culture because then we come away from biblical truths. Today it seems like emotions is elevated above truth. And so one of the things that I'm just studying the critical race theory and council culture, one of the things that is the statement that goes along with it is your emotions, your feelings is greater than the truth. How you feel. And it's like, wow, what happened to truth? What happened to coming together and, and speaking truth in love and, and valuing one another and caring for one another? Uh, this is important. He goes on to say, he says, you know, besides the hostility and anger and outbursts, which we see that today, he goes on and then he says, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
If we mold ourselves into the world, then we have rejected our faith and we don't know God in a real life-changing way. Our concept in, in this series has been letting God's word transform us. And if we have a relationship with God, he will transform us through his word. Now he makes the statement this. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience. I mean, if, if just that alone, <laughs> four attributes that we as a church, that we as believers in Christ would be known for love. Even when we disagree, we still love someone. Uh, that we do all that we can on our end to make peace with one another, that we become patient with one another, that we show kindness even when we disagree, that we do what is right and good, faithfulness, gentleness, self-controlled, just self-controlled, delayed gratification. I think if we started teaching that uh, to our kids, that can make a giant change in their maturity level. Today, uh, we don't have delayed gratification. We don't have it in things. <laughs> like if I, you know, the new, the new phone, what is it, the i13's out? I got to have it, right? You know, <laughs> um, It's not wrong to buy it. It's just, if you can't afford it, you wait. You save up. I know it's a new concept, but I, it's just one of those things, you know. Um, you wait, you save up, and then you buy it. If we could bring some of that into our, our teaching of our kids, I think that would help in the maturity level. Uh, Paul says, there is no law against these things. And again, looking over these love and patience and kindness and gentleness, and who's going to make a law against those? So how do we battle their culture? I think we battle our culture by standing up for truth. We battle our culture uh, by standing up for showing patience with one another. The social media has now gotten to a place where, I don't know how much longer I'll be, <laughs> even on Facebook, the shaming, the harsh accusations against people, it's like, the throttling, they call it. It's like, wow, we've lost our humanity. I, I, I think it's like, there's no patience. There's no self-control. It's, it's like, how deeply can I verbally shame you, hurt you, to make you bend to my will? I think it needs to stop. And at least it needs to stop with us who call ourselves a believer in Christ. Paul says there's, there's no law that ever will be against showing love and patience and kindness and gentleness, um, self-control. There's never going to be a law against that. Verse 24, he says, those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. I think what's important about this point is that we have, as a Christian, you and I, we have passions that are towards lust, towards anger, towards division. There's, there's in my soul, in my body, I, there's, there's times where it's like someone cuts me off on the freeway. <laughs> I don't want to wish them a happy day. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I'm angry, you know? Um, and, and I think we're, a lot of us, we have this pent-up anger. I've noticed that. In me, <laughs> at least, and in, in others. We nail our passions, our desires that are opposing to the gospel. We nail it to the cross. We realize that Jesus died for my anger. He died for my lust. He, he died for my dissension. He, he died for all of those things, drunkenness and all that. He died for that. How, can, how could I continue to invest in that? Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to it. Look at yourself. First question, who or what do you make the biggest sacrifice for? What, what seems to be really the priority? I mean, when you get out of bed, what's, what's the priority for the day, the week? 
The second question is, in what area are you conforming to the culture? And we listed a lot of things here. Paul could have gone on and on, but it was enough for us to see ourselves and say, okay, I can see I get angry. I, I, I can see oh, I, I give in to lust. Oh, where, where are you conforming? How do you battle against it? You yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and love, patience, kindness, and, and that can make the biggest difference. And then the third question to ask ourselves, again, to be a true worshiper, the biggest question here, uh, the third question is, how am I renewing my mind to align with God's word? How am I renewing my mind? We gotta have a game plan. This can't be just, oh, that's a great sermon, thank you. That won't do anything tomorrow. How? What, what is your action plan? And, and so for us, our, our mission is to help people find and to follow Jesus, right? So find him is to begin a relationship with him. To follow him is to grow in that relationship. And, and so some of the tools that we give to encourage you to grow in your faith, to be transformed by his truth, is, we're going to talk about those in just a minute. Let's, let's read this first, verse 2. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing, and perfect will. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, renewing your mind. How do you do that? Well, we, we read God's word, right? We listen to sermons. Uh, we journal down um, God's word, and we journal down our personal application. These are areas that we can apply in our personal life. Hebrews 13, it, it says this. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant through, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of, feet, of sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's all through the power of the blood of Christ. So again, how do we do this? What, what's our game plan? Um, listening to sermons, taking notes, Every time you, you write down something, you're going to remember twice as much. Talking it over with a family friend or, or a small group. I, I think it's so important that you're involved in a small group. I encourage you to take a couple of questions with your family. Don't do the whole lesson, but maybe just one or two questions. And at the dinner table, you can go a little deeper um, just to help remember what you studied in the morning. Um, journaling through God's Word. Now, we have three journals for the book of Romans. Uh, we have journals through Ephesians, journal through Philippians, Colossians, several books of the Bible that you can get and you can read God's word, journal down your personal application, pray through God's word, and I'll tell you what, it will help change, transform your mind. And then praying through scripture. So what kind of worship am I giving to the Lord? That's, that's the bottom line here. What's, what kind of worship am I giving? Is my worship half-hearted? Is my worship occasional, you know, like when I have time, but my priority right now is fishing? <laughs> my priority right now is golfing. My priority right now is whatever, sports. Our God truly is my priority. What kind of worship am I giving? I wanted to read this passage one more time. These two verses, I think, can be critical, uh, worshiping the Lord. Um, verse 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What is giving your whole self? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So I want to take this passage and, and just give an example of praying back through Scripture. And this is something I, I encourage you to do in each of our journals. You read God's word, 
and then you pray back through it. So as we read through this, um, and I'm going to just do this out loud, and, and you can do this with me. Dear Lord, today, I'm offering my body to be a living sacrifice for your glory. Let my hands serve you. Let my feet carry me where you want me to go. Let my words be uplifting and encouraging to the people I'm around today. Don't let me give in to division. I want my life to be an example of your love and your mercy. Our culture seeks to drag us down with division and immorality. It's destroying our families, our marriages. I know to serve you will mean I have to live counter to our culture. And through this, I may receive insults and ridicule. Give me the courage to stand up for truth, to display your grace and mercy daily in my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. So this is something I do as a practice. I encourage you when you take one of those journals, it's part of the journal, is you read back through God's word and then you pray back through as a personal application. As you start to make a habit of this, your prayer life is going to deepen well beyond asking God for needs. That'll be part of it. But it'll deepen in a relationship with God. Let's continue now to worship. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even though I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are me, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me,
rest in your presence. We rest in your promise that you never let go of us, God. We thank you that we can walk with you, that we can trust in you. And I pray will you be with all the families, every brother and sister at home, God. I pray you watch over, protect them, keep them safe. Bring them back here safely, God. Be with us this week. Guide us this week as we trust in you. Thank you that you never let go of us. No matter how far we've gone, we can come back and run into your arms. So, Father, we are grateful. We are thankful. Thank you that we have the honor, the privilege to worship you, to be in your presence. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, all the family say, amen. Cornerstone family, thank you so much for joining us online today. And when you feel comfortable, we would love to see you live and in person here in our beautiful sanctuary, 9, 15, and 11 a.m. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you so much for your generosity. You're truly helping people find and follow Jesus. This month, we're doing a blanket drive for interfaith. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to have your support. God bless. God bless you.